speakers have already arrived. Uh, uh, we'll commence the program another one or two minutes. Uh, I think to give time to the people who are outside enjoying their refreshments, I will take one more minute uh, to just brief you what's happening in MMA next few days so that uh, you don't miss them. We attend them either in person at MMA or online through our various social media portals. Next event is happening on 14th of uh, December. Read and Grow series, uh, you know, we strongly believe the great leader, you have to be a great leader, you have to be a great reader. And next series is happening on uh, timeless lessons on risk and opportunity, living a good life. Uh, this is uh, Babu Krishnamurti leading the conversation with Sridhar, chairman of Irmak Company and uh, Bharati Krish. This is happening on 14th. Then 18th, uh, we have again event on A, Pranjal Patak will be talking this an online program on the 18th. Uh, we already got the communication. On the 19th December, again, not to be a missed program, but this program is happening at 11 a.m. in the morning online. Again, Mr. Madhavan Nair, you all know Madhavan Nair. He is the former chairman of ISRO, one of the finest management uh, personality, and I, I, I think you all should walk miles to listen to him. He has agreed to speak to us at 11 o'clock in the morning because that's the slot only available. I'm quite sure that online, it suits our members, 11 o'clock. They can quietly do it at the office and get inspired. And we have uh, Mr. Das, former IAS uh, officer retired. He'll be chairing this session. Now on 21st December, again, not to be missed the event, thanks to our president, Mr. Mali, we have got Gopi Kalyali. is a chief business strategist from AA Google USA. He's on a visit to Chennai. He'll be talking to us on 21st of December at MMA in person. Then we have on 4th of January, we have got again a very high profile event, uh, Dance of Disruption and Creation. We have got Nandan Nandakishore, former uh, global CEO of Nestle. Uh, Neeraj Chandra is again CEO of Britannia. We got some outstanding panel here. Uh, it's a big name. I got another few seconds left uh, before we move on to today's program. On 8th of January, again, we have an excellent program on family businesses. In the, the guide to building enduring Indian family businesses. We've got outstanding people who have contributed significantly to the family businesses. And we have CK Ranganathan, he's a part of uh, discussion, he'll be there, along with <coughs> Nawaz Miran and also Mr. M.S. Ekumar. Nawaz Miran was a leading business personality in condiments from Kerala, and M.S. Ekumar again, a consultant leading business from Kerala. Then on 18th, we have Read and Grow. Then we have on 19th, Banking Reforms, and just giving the heading. Then on 24th of January, again, not to be missed event, our annual event. This is fourth Narayanan Memorial Endowment Lecture sponsored by Pons. We have lessons learned in a disruption. We have Mr. Gobal Vittal, MD and CEO of Bharat Airtel is going to be the speaker. Because that, we have lined up a number of events at the chapters, uh, uh, various chapters, and also online program, number of, number of certificate courses. I am quite sure you can just Google, watch it on our website, and you will be able to. Coming to today's event, um, uh, our fifth R.K. Swami Memorial Lecture 2023. R.K. Swami is very, very dear to us uh, on many ways because he is one of the person most responsible for making uh, MMA award it is today, contributed, and also uh, not only him and his son, Mr. Srinivasan K. Swami, also popular in one of Sundar, is also contributed significantly. We are indeed privileged and blessed and honored to host this event, uh, Memorial Lecture, year after year. This lecture is uh, really, really very, very popular in the calendar of events of MMA. And uh, there's an happy occasion on the birth anniversary of uh, Mr. R.K. Sami hosting this uh, event. We've got two outstanding speakers, a speaker couple, I can say that, who are going to be really enthrall you with some um, phenomenal ideas, phenomenal concept of some of the subject very rarely discussed. And uh, the speaker will be very in detail introduced by Mr. Swami. We have with us Dr. D.K. Hari and Dr. D.K. Mrs. Hari will be there, the founder trustee of Bharat Gyan. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of uh, applause to the different speakers. They will be talking to us today on our heritage, our pride. Now, may I request uh, the distinguished speakers, uh, Hari, Mrs. Hari, and Mr. Mahalingam, Mr. Srinivasan Swami, and Mr. Balasamuni, please take the place on the dais. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause to our distinguished guests this evening. Is it? 
the format of the program uh, as usual before that i also want to tell you uh, i hope you are all safe uh, the water is really come down uh, and your valve is sump and all the tanks are filled up the ground water is charged you don't have any water problem and uh, at mma small little contribution the people across the road were totally uh, got disturbed by the water they almost up to 4 5 feet of water we accommodated all of them at mma uh, for 2 3 days and gave them food gave them shelter uh, why we do this is uh, i think that's what we need uh, uh, to support the team which support us in a big way and coming back to today's event the format of the event as i mentioned to you um, after i request mr mahalingam to give us a welcome formal welcome address there of request mr sinwasan swami to give the introductory remarks then uh, the fifth arka swami memorial lecture will be delivered by dr hari and hema hari then as usual if you have any questions uh, the number which is flashed on the screen please send your question to the number all the questions will be put uh, placed before the speaker to answer them people who are here uh, we'll pass you the slips that if you say no 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 we wanted to speak to mike we'll give it to you Uh, we only request you to only address the questions uh, because the heritage lecture will be delivered only by the speaker then uh, we have mr bala to deliver what up thanks now it's my proud privilege to uh, request mr mahalingam uh, who is also president of madras management association he is uh, uh, alumnus of nit trichy and i am calcutta and has got 35 years of transport leadership driving ts magalingam and sons if you have own a car i think uh, you will know ts magalingam and sons now you know all the more after the rain a lot of cars are floating you have to go to him now to get a new car and i request mr mali to please deliver the formula commenters mr mali thank you vijay for your kind words good evening everybody mm, it's uh... it's indeed my privilege and pleasure to deliver the formal welcome address this evening at this very very special event the fifth rk swami memorial lecture this evening we're indeed privileged to to institute and organize this annual memorial lecture in the name of late shri rk swami the doyen of indian advertising profession to remind ourselves of his pioneering spirit and carry his legacy forward it is indeed my honor to welcome this evening dr dk hari and dr dk hema hari researchers and founders bharat gyan uh, i must mention on a personal note it's a pleasant surprise that uh, my a very dear friend is a cousin for them and that connect actually was quite surprising he looked familiar but uh, when when he asked me i realized thanks and great to meet you and i will tell gopal this actually his cousin is tt uh, uh, ram gopal head of android partnerships who had spoken at mma last year actually so we are both of you on stage already thank you <laughs> i also welcome mr s balasubramanian president and members of the art club who joined us this evening it is also my privilege to welcome members of the family of rk swami it's a proud memory moment for the members of mma who would recollect the enormous contribution of mr rk swami in the progress and growth of mma to what it is today particularly his active involvement guidance and support during his tenure as president of mma from 1972 to 1974 if mma today has transformed itself into the largest management station in the country and bestowed the honor of being the best management station for the last 14 years in a row a great deal of this achievement is rightly attributable to the vision thought and initiatives of many luminaries among whom mr rk swami was the foremost MMA with a membership of over 8000 members spread across the corporate houses individuals academicians and students conducts more than 750 programs annually all this would not be possible without the constant guidance and support of our past presidents including mr shrinivas and k swami with whom i am privileged to share the dais this evening thank you it it would not be out of place to mention that this magnificent MMA management center that we are also proud of and currently in couldn't have come up without the generous support from industry which was so passionately facilitated by mr shrinivas and k swami as chairman of the fundraising committee thank you again sir in, in in many ways you can see we are here thanks to you <laughs> sir this entire mma fraternity would forever be thankful to you for this colossal effort today's endowment lecture on the theme our heritage our pride which is very appropriate considering the significant value that late shri rk swami attributed to ancient indian culture and heritage he was that unusual unusual is the word advertising professional 
hailing from a very humble and traditional family background. His contribution not only towards economic development of Tamil Nadu, but also his contribution to the world of art, culture and heritage would be remembered forever. Our heritage, our pride is certainly we have many reasons to feel proud of our heritage. It could, we could talk of the cultural heritage, the literary heritage, literary, uh, literature, music, dance, drama, so many things. Our cultural heritage is not only rich but extremely diverse. Our heritage of scientific temper, math, science, astronomy, you name it, and India was, has a huge rich heritage. Not to forget uh, the philosophical heritage of this country. We have had the most defined philosophies emerging out of India and the most divine philosophers. And most importantly, all this, we have an heritage of all-inclusive, all-embracing. We have managed to be a civilization which has embraced multiple faiths and survived so many thousands of years. So that's a significant heritage we need to be proud of and should be proud of. We're eager to learn more about the theme from our distinguished speakers this evening, really looking forward. Uh, I'm glad that this annual endowment lecture in the memory of Mr. R.K. Swami has evolved into a great knowledge sharing platform, taking his legacy to the next generation of management professionals. I've attended three of these lectures and each one of them has been outstanding. I take this opportunity to welcome the past presidents of MMA, colleagues from the management committee, MMA, uh, members of MMA distinguished NYDs and guests watching this program in person and online. I think we have another past president, Mr. Gopal Yad. Welcome, Gopal. And finally, I must say that uh, it's all just about three, four days since we recovered from the floods and to see such a large crowd here is really encouraging. Did you have a program before this? Is this the first program after the floods? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I discounted Vijay Kumar's ability. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All of you have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mali. Now it's my proud privilege to request Mr. Srinivasan K. Swami to offer the introductory remarks. It's also my equal privilege to say a few words about the introduction. Uh, Srinivasan Swami, the Chairman and Managing Director of the RK Swami Limited, overseeing diverse ventures in advertising, market research, analytics, and real estate. With over 2,000 employees and over $100 million turnover, he holds leadership position uh, of professional bodies of many of the advertising companies, many of the associations. Uh, serving various social causes. He uh, is the president of Indomission Hospital, chairman of Valduar uh, Kottam and uh, Valduar Gurukulam Society, showcasing his commitment to both industry and community service. He is also the past president of MMA and IMA. I request Mr. Swami to deliver the introductory remarks and also introduce the speaker. President Mali. President Balasabhumunyam, past presidents MMA, past presidents Retouching Club, executive members of MMA and uh, that club, my good friends Hema and uh, Hari, friends. <clears throat> Let me add my own welcome to the Ramali. He already had been very warm in his welcome. Uh, I want to add my own welcome to his kind words for the fifth Arkeson Memorial Lecture. I also want to thank him for all the kind words he showered on us. So thank you very much for all those kind words. It sometimes gets embarrassing if you, you Shankar walking in. <laughs> I just, I think it's been a fine journey last five years. The fifth memorial lecture is a culmination of four different subjects we undertook, each different, and I would say each eclectic in nature. We started out with D. Shivakumar, where he talked about the future of consumer engagement. Then we moved on to Seshai, where he talked about values for the 21st century is again very, very different, but very required to be re remembering what kind of values that we should actually embrace in the new era. And we talked about how social media was influencing a lot and all that. 
Then we moved on to his Gurumuthi. He talked about emerging global civilization paradigm in India. Again, very similar to what Hari would say, be what he said, but, but, but Gurumuthi was talking about more future. I'm assuming Hari will talk more about past. And of course, we had the former finance minister, Pandemir Thakarajan, last year, talking about uh, shaping Tamil Nadu towards a trillion dollar state. So this year, as I said, we have this wonderful sort of speakers, uh, Hema and uh, Hari, and they're going to talk about our heritage, our pride. This is the kind of subject that are very, very close to my father's heart. As Ms. Malingam said, you, you actually nailed it very well. It's something that my father believed in, our, and the treasured our heritage. He felt that, uh, you know, he was one of those human beings who can actually quote from the Puranas, quote from various uh, scriptures, and connect to the task at hand. That's the kind of person that he was. And I'm sure, you know, some of those nuggets of information that Hari and Hema will share will also be uh, the same zone. I know this couple for a long time. Uh, I know when, you, when they got married. And, uh, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, I've been part of their family for several decades. And it so happens that uh, uh, my father knew them also very well. So, and he wanted to talk about a subject of communication in the Asher era. And I said, no, no, let's not get that. I think let's not talk about communication because he said there's lots to talk about. I said, maybe there's lots to talk about, but I'd rather focus on our heritage, our culture, than talk about communication in a different era. <clears throat> uh, having said that, I think uh, Hema and uh, Hari gave up their lucrative jobs some 25 years ago, started Bharat Gyan, an NGO, a trust, and they devoted they devote considerable amount of their time in doing work that actually dig deep, digs deep into the Indic civilization of this country. They actually are amazing in the quality of research and the depths they go to in unearthing the facts and connecting the dots in a manner that is going to be very difficult for normal persons to deal with. He will talk about the root words on some of the aspects and talk about why those root words are going to lead to this kind of expression and how this is actually connecting with the rest of the stuff. So the amazing kind of a you know, couple that I've seen and I'm sure that they will make us all more learned about uh, our past. Because our past, if you celebrate, it will be something that that will help us understand the future better. Uh, today, our history books do not show our history that we can be proud of. There is, there is subjects of this kind that we need to be talking about in other fora, so that we do know there is another dimension of history, which is what makes us all very really proud. And so that way I think Hema and Hari are very, very, uh, you know, relevant. And we should have more of these people in this country to make a big difference. As I said, I know that this, the same couple, at least for 30 years, uh, I think we got to know each other mid 80s to start with, and then, then I, they got married later that the that, that decade, 28, 28, 29, something, something like that. So, I think, yes, and we were uh, in touch with that family. Uh, this, is, uh, this is something that they got into without hesitation, with, without actually talking about. Can I afford to give up my lucrative job? Am I wasting my time? There's no much of pressure, family pressure on them to say, don't do this. Because this is not going to give you, this is not going to put bread on the table. It's not going to put your, you know, 
it's not easy for you to make a name for yourself. But they motor along and they did very well. They are part of Art of Living for almost a decade. And uh, they, they have written actually more than 100 books. They have written more than 100 blogs. They have actually got 500 hours of uh, multi, uh, what is it, multi, whatever, uh, that, uh, the AVs that they have. So, <clears throat> and I have not come across such prolific writers and people who are going to be, uh, you know, connecting the dots as it were all the time for us. So, I give you Hema and Hari. So thank you very much for being here. Really good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You want a mask? Sundar. Sundar, your mask. Sundar. Thank you. Thank you, Sundar, first of all, for inviting us. And then uh, this wonderful introduction that you gave. It's, it's a very personal <laughs> introduction you gave about us. And uh, thank you to MMA and uh, Group Captain Vijay Kumar for inviting us to be part of this. And so many known faces, friends, through the decades and so many new friends that we'll be making this evening it's wonderful to be here uh, out of the earlier four uh in nomad lectures of shakya Shami, three we have certainly attended so we have been very much part of the family and uh, as he said uh, the first time I met shakya Shami was probably in 1982 uh, so since then uh, been knowing all the members of the family so well and it's, 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 it's certainly a Honor for us to be speaking at the memorial lecture. Thank you so much. And as he said about uh, the idea of Bharat Gyan, see the the we came up. He said with a lot of uh, hurdles we had to get through to do what we are doing because we liked it. That's one. And as all of us have been traveling, we have also been traveling a lot. And what we found was wherever we went, in each place they showcased what they have well. But we unfortunately have not been showcasing, not now, I'm talking about in the 90s, the pre-Google era. There was, no, there was hardly any showcasing of this land. So the point was, we asked, what is there to speak about India? What is there about our civilization? Can we speak about it in a logical, rational, scientific way to the youngsters? In a way they will understand, in their lingo. So that's what we sort of got into it. We, we, we left our careers at the peak to get into Understanding the knowledge of our civilization. And when he said uh, the subject being our heritage, our pride, thought it will be apt for it. And when you say heritage, all of us normally think about heritage as only uh, certain uh, buildings, monuments, temples and all that. That's what you think of. Chennai, as he said, has gone through a tremendous flood. So, the lakes and water bodies of Chennai too are our heritage. If we had looked after our heritage, we would not have been in the mess that we were, have been. Because we have about 4,000 plus water bodies enumerated in and around Greater Chennai. If we had known how to sort of keep them in good repair, as mentioned by Major Sanke 170 years back, in good repair and well connected, we would not have been in this mess. So, understanding heritage is not just of the past, but of immediate use as of last week also. And so for the Coming week also, when we have one more, probably one more boat of rains, one more cyclone. So, it's very important. That's inheritance. It's not just the jewellery or the land document is inheritance. Every aspect of this is our inheritance, actually. So that's our heritage and that's really our pride. That's what the fact it is. And uh, getting on to the man, Sri R.K. Swami, when, he's, when he told us about this, one thing has always occurred to me. He was more than his measure. A tall stature man, knowledgeable, but he was also, we felt that. And uh, when we have traveled different parts, we found one thing. In Jaipur, if you go, you'll, you'll get the Savai Mansing st uh, Stadium. And uh, one of the nine gems of Akbar was also Savai Mansing. Uh, so, what does the word Savai there mean? It means one and a quarter. So, something more than a person. He was more than a man. 
Certainly, it was similarly. If you go to Turkey, uh, if you look at Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal Pasha, the word Ataturk means two and a quarter, two and a half. Adai, we say as in Hindi. So he's more than a he's more than a man. Similarly, Sri R K Swami was also certainly more than the measure that he was in many a ways, knowledge, stature, accomplishment. So we thought that should be the first slide to say that he certainly belongs to that league. <laughs> Thank you that all of you sort of think so really nice and that we knew this man was even more happening personally. And uh, we found this beautiful quote from the book uh, R.K. Swami, His Life and Times. To justify and this point. To justify this point and I'll just read out this bit for those who can't perhaps uh, read it from far. In 1982, when David Ogilvy visited Madras, I requested Swami, I is Mr. Mani Iyer. I requested Swami to host a dinner. Swami readily obliged. After interacting with Swami for, a time, for some time, the following conversation ensued between me and David. Mani, tell me seriously, is this man in advertising? I said, yes. Really? Or is it a hobby? Asked David Ogilvy. I said, no, he is a very serious practitioner. Why do you ask? David said, well, quite frankly, what a waste of talent in advertising. So, so look at the man that he is. Wealth of talent. So, and which we, uh, we were very happy, you know, with this backdrop. Uh, it's very nice to see him sitting there and we here, uh, you know, almost as, at his feet. Because we have had a uh, number of occasions where we interacted with him. And we could hear, uh, you know, pearls of wisdom from him. We have been inspired actually very early days of Bharat Gyan, even before we started Bharat Gyan. We have been inspired by a lot of interactions with uh, Sri R.K. Swami. And we have discussed this idea with him also then. Okay, go next point. So this talk on our heritage and our pride, uh, we dedicated it, we dedicated to his memory. And especially to honor the skills of speech, script, signages, and spirituality that he exemplified. That's the key point. And see, uh, we want to see, he, is, he started his light as a corporate early stage in, in South Gujarat, I guess. So, so he was discerning, like the Hansa, his symbol. Like that we saw, the, the two other ins, instances we can see here, the early scribe, Lord Ganesha, he scribed, his thing was, only when I understand it, I'll scribe. So Ganesha exemplified knowledge and understanding. So he didn't write just because sage Veda Vyasa Krishna Dwaipena dictated something to him. He wrote it after understanding it. So they, he, he put that clause, only I'll write scribe only after understanding. So similarly, if you look at the Egyptian scribes, the famous Egyptian scribes. So you have Thoth, who is the official Egyptian scribe. And uh, he is actually symbolized as an ibis, which is a bird that signifies balance and, uh, you know, being very right, impartial when they write. So like that, we've had people who represent certain aspects and uh, we've had uh, Sri R.K. Swami as well, who has been lovely quotes that you can find in that book of, uh, on him. So coming... From that aspect, if you look at it, so talking about these early scribes, how do we know about our heritage, our past? So we get to know from what they have left behind. But very sadly, some of the things that we see are things we haven't been able to understand so far. But luckily now there have been some breakthroughs. And uh, these are some of these signs like these circles and crosses and lines. But these you find going way back to more than 5,000 years. And these are some messages that they have left behind for us. Look, look at this, this one of the world's Chinese. oldest signboard. Well over 5,000 years ago. This is in a place called Dolavira. So, so that's the excavation site where you have the signboard at the top and the way it's been sort of remarked here for, for us in the slab below. So look at this. So we're talking about, you talk about signages today. Can you think of 5,000 year old signage in a language that we can understand? Let's look at that now. So, the messaging. And these kind of signs, how far do you find? You find them all the way from, you won't believe, Tahiti to Phoenicia. This entire stretch you find these kind of signs. And interestingly, you will find that these are places where you also find a lot of influence about 
of influence of the Bharatiya civilization. And if you so, still won't believe uh, about one Tahiti. Second. No, one second. Because many people think Indian civilization is to be very limited geographically. But here we are going to show you real live examples. The spread of it from Tahiti, which is in Polynesia, Micronesia, Easter Islands, all the way up to the Mediterranean. Amazing. From the Pacific Ocean to that. Not now, 4,000 years ago, they had the same signage systems across. Look at the spread of the civilization, spread of knowledge, spread of communication. And how did they communicate? Today we, we find it difficult to communicate across two states. Here these people come, communicate across continents, across ages. Look at that. And so, here is the Tahiti script and the Harappan script. Look how similar they are. We'll show you more details. And uh, this was called the Rongo Rongo tablet. In Tahiti. Here you will find it even more. So this person, Hevsef, he points out 90 similarities. Look at this. This is the Rongo Rongo Easter Island script and this is the Indus Valley script. Look at each one of them. We have tabulated it for our research purpose which we are sharing here. This slow, is slow, carved slow, slow, on wood, slow, slow, this slow, is slow. on clay. So look at that. Across the seven seas, Saat Samandar Par, identical 5000 years ago. So look at the messaging that goes. One on clay tablet, one on wood. So, so that's one you can see that. So on, we showed you one end. Now we'll show you the other end in Phoenicia. Look at this. So Phoenicia. what is Phoenicia famous for? What do people recognize Phoenicia for? Of course, today you don't have Phoenicia as one nation or one civilization. Uh, you find it spread across many of the East Mediterranean uh, countries. countries. But Phoenicia is supposed to have been the source for the Western alphabets. Which is why you see Phoenicia, phoneme, phonetics, phone, and... Have you ever thought all this comes from the word, from the Phoenician civilization? And, and that is the was, basis of communication for whole of Europe. It was a precursor for Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, and then English. Because today if you look at it, the English alphabets, they are traced to the Phoenician alphabets. Now... If you look at the English alphabets, the Roman alphabets, you have A, B, C, D, E, this is the order. Arabic, you have Aleph, Bey, Gim. Greek, you have this order. One second. But you do not have a very solid explanation for the sequence. Why, Why does should... B come after A? Sure. So we sort of compete with each other. <laughs> See, the point is, look at the beauty of it. Do you have any scientific explanation as to why should B come after A? Or why should uh, C come bef before D? Be it in any of the languages. None. We don't have any explanation as to sequencing. So, then it's not scientific. Because you can, you can start the alphabet with the L, M, and Q, Z, K, B, C. You can do. It's right. You're right. There's, there's no need of. So, there's no logic. Whereas, look at... Our Indian language, all Indian languages, be it Punjabi to Sharada script to Assamese to the one in Nagaland to Sinhala to Tamil to Baluchi, all of them. So you have the vowels and you have the consonants and Tamil, we beautifully call them Uir Eirthu, Mei Eirthu. And uh, there's a very deep uh, meaning to why we have named them such as well. And you will find actually... Tamil, they write it like this, all the uh, alphabets. But then if you put it down like this, you see a beautiful similarity between both of them. And we have organized them as series of ka, cha, ta, ta, and so on. Why did we do it like this? Why is the question. While we don't have a why, we can't even ask a question why there, nor will we get an answer. Here we can ask a question why and also get an answer. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty. That's the science, the logic, the rational in communication. And we are going to see just that. When, when people say it's one of the most perfect scripts, but why is it the most perfect script? Have we asked ourselves that question? See, so many people will say this or that, but why? Do we have a logical answer? So, vowels, uh, they are the life givers, the uirirtha, because they are just sound that come out unobstructed. A, e, u, and all, they just unobstructed by any of the contours of your mouth. And then you look at this. If you want to say ka, then you have to modulate it with the parts of your mouth. Your buccal cavity has to modulate it and you get the ka out. Then you have the, when it touches the palate, upper palate, you have the cha. You try saying all these, as you talk, you will realize where your tongue has to touch. 
So you find that our ancestors had actually understood the anatomy of the buccal cavity. Which are the parts? When does a sound come? When what part touches which other aspect of the mouth? Danta, teeth, dental. Look at the Indian word danta to the dantam of elephant to dental to dentistry. Same root. So see how this ta bring the lips together. So, so you see that. So you cannot change the sequence of alphabet in Indian civilization languages. There's a logic, there's a rush, you can't change it. And of course, it's all biological. It all deals de de with your oral cavity. It's scientific. So that is the fundamental aspect of communication that we see here. And this now, uh, there are people who have actually tried to trace the source and falling back on... Of the Phoenician alphabets, of the Phoenician sequence. And comparing it with the Indian alphabets, they are now able to conclude that it was the Indian alphabets which have traveled to Phoenicia and during this a couple of swaps have happened which therefore have yielded the order of A, B, C, D that you see today. So that is something and you will find that in this paper by a person called Wim Bors Boone and uh, he has written extensively that while copying there were two errors of historic proportion that's what he says. So. Uh, so far, people have been saying that the Phoenician alphabets are from the Egyptian hieroglyphs alone. But if you see that uh, this particular thing actually talks about the sequence and they are able to justify and explain how the sequence has got changed. Now, is that the only reason? I mean, can we just say just because of this that, uh, you know, Alphabet our alphabets one. and the science of sound has traveled from India to the West? Look at it. There is yet another beautiful example, which is the Saptaswara. The notating, see music is very natural. Everybody can sing, everybody can make melodious sounds. The thing is, the, the science comes when you want to translate that sound into a written form. Into a form that you can read and then recall or produce, reproduce the kind of melody that was originally produced. So that is when you need the notations and then you need to represent those melodious notes. So you need to figure out how in your anatomy can you reproduce those notes. And if you look at it, this notating swaras, again, uh, all of you would know that uh, in India we talk about uh, Sarigama Padani, right? And you would also be familiar with Doremi, the seven notes. And Do they are both very similar. In uh, our Indian, we would say, Sari Gama Padani. The same thing in Doremi. Doremi Fa Solati. So they're very similar. So why is this similarity there? And, and, and seven in both. Why? So similar. Who got it from where? Who has got the answer? Who is who's got the logical scientific reason because that decides the methodology of communication again. So, interestingly, in India we are able to explain. If you go back to our uh, ancient texts, you will find the very clear explanation for these notes. So, we say sa, that is shadjam. Now, the beauty that we have done, I mean, this is mastery. What they have done here is See, on one side, so you didn't need the notes to actually sing. You can sing without the notes. You can all, we can all make music. But there are some notes which are pleasant to hear. Now, when you come to those pleasant notes, what did our ancestors do? They figured out what, where is it coming from? Originate. Where is it originating from? Where, I mean, originate meaning where is it resonating inside your body? So if you look at it, sa, when you try, and then they picked up animals whose sounds, if you imitate, you will create the same resonance. It's not that the animal, if you hear a peacock, I think today everybody, they get disappointed. You know, people who come from abroad to see the peacock, they look at it for the beauty and they expect it to have a beautiful voice, but you know, they listen to the voice, oh my God, is that a peacock? But the sound of a peacock may not sound like sir. But the resonance it creates is what is the same as when you sing a sir. So try, you, you do that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to show you small examples and you can try that yourself too. So try singing 
sa it will come all the way you have to get the sound out from your navel nabi nabi and why do you equate that with a peacock what is the sound of a peacock try uh, thinking of the sound of a peacock it will do you have to get that sound out from your navel all the way from your navel because it has this long neck then look at the bull rishabam as we call it how does a bull make a sound ma ma so this sound resonates here at the chest similarly you try the different animals the goat gandharam me me the sound is from here so these animals as you imitate they all lead you to the different points of vibration and the resonance points of resonance and that's how they are beautifully named while rishabham gandharam they are all similar to the animals why is shadjam for a peacock why is the naming so because it's a mayur or mayil why did they call it shadjam even there you can see the subtlety the you science see, the science and the subtle understanding so this sound when it comes all the way from the navel it has to transcend your chest your throat the base of your tongue your nose your teeth and lips so six nodes it passes through it it it's, it's born six times over j ja, meaning birth sh the meaning six so it's six times born so because six. it passes through six aspects of your alimentary canal system so six <laughs> resonating points so shut jam therefore six times born sound so that is how so this what does this tell us it tells us that we have understood this so well we have understood the logic of sound music script everything the, or the whole vocal cord system we understood so scientifically uniquely and in the western you have the same seven notes as do re mi fa so how did these come about now that is very interesting so while we are able to show with logic and science as to how these notes are coming up in the western if you see if you ask them how did do re mi come about what you will find is they will trace it to a hymn of saint john and here it is this is the hymn i won't read the latin because uh, i mean i'll straight away go to the english so with all the voice can be sung your wonderful feats by your servants to wipe clean their tainted lips o saint john so they took yut re mi fa so la sancte jonas so saint and john so in and over time this yut became do re mi fa so la c s i became t so this is how they are able to trace and in our book we have written in detail how this holds good even for the japanese the japanese have got an iroha system even there they trace it to the starting letters of their uh, i mean certain the, hymns the old hymn now the point is if you go in western classical music it stops here beyond this you, you don't have anything to go any explanation it, it's got a glass ceiling and not solid concrete ceiling if you go to japanese eastern side you have a solid ceiling there you can't go beyond that whereas in indian thought it goes all the way up to nature prakriti yerkai and that's where you don't have a ceiling at all either glass or concrete nothing you go right through so you directly into so that is what we understood this aspect that's why we could sort of traverse over 4000 years across continents across seas and communicate and therefore look at it the word for speech itself is bharati bharati one of the meanings i mean we actually have a, it's beautiful how we have named our land bharat many many meanings and one of them is also bharati which means speech and look at what we have therefore done we have decided yes we won't stop with speech but we will see how to communicate without speaking and how to also preserve the speech so we have gone into the mode of writing it is actually a myth that uh, in india every uh, knowledge everything that was uh, uh, knowledge or science was given or was only oral. oral that's a myth we yeah. had writing right from the very beginning aksharam sharam is to dissolve aksharam not dissolve the look at the term itself and 
so for writing what do you therefore do this continuous speech how do you break it down into units that can be written down so that is what becomes your alphabet your phoneme your syllable and that thus was born your a a e e your vowels and then your ka ka ga ga and everything and then the various rules of how these sounds combine so this has been our uh, progress and it's because of this understanding that we have been able to surmount the challenges of uh, going across ages age groups civilizations geographies languages and scripts but the question now will come okay you've said all this but how did they really still communicate between tahiti up to phoenicia that's the question look at this today even when we go with all the translators that we have if you go to uh, say japan or tahiti or uh, some other country or turkey or uh, azerbaijan we'll be tongue tied to talk to them isn't it with all the things that we have with us think of this 4000 years back our traders went and traded there communicated can you imagine Ne neither did they know where the land was did they know the language nor the people but still they successfully went okay sh we should look at that perspective how did they do it both the sounds and the scripts where, where they did not know where people existed or where the land existed that's the beauty of what they did so that's all in the mind that's that is when you the, you find that the trade and the symbols and signages so those dholavira signs that we saw they were fundamentally used for by the trading community for trade so we had commerce was a basic aksharams in which we wrote our literature and we also had symbols and signs so aksharam where was for people who knew that particular language who spoke that particular language who could write that particular script and so for them within the internal we could use the aksharam but when you had to transcend boundaries you started using symbols and signs and these are today one of the last uh scripts to be deciphered and there have been some marvelous breakthroughs especially uh, it's been found that it can be uh deciphered using a rebus technique that is where you use words and the symbols for uh, uh explaining what the words for example i mean we're just using two very simple examples just two sa two samples we're going to use so this for is for of time just use two look at this this is one of the seals and there is this one particular symbol here one small figure if you put it down it looks like this this is very similar to a squirrel and what does the squirrel denote fundamentally so what they would use is they would use the word a squirrel in a language i mean and and there is a beauty that's also been discovered is that there have been because of the trade there have been words that have become popular across all these lands see it's very easy i can go to a new land show my product and say bottle 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 so after a few days they understand this is bottle so like that they have picked up some of the words and one was for shreni and who is a shreni a trader he is an aggregator in in indian Whoa. context trade is aggregation aggregation of produce from various small scale units all over the land we have been a decentralized uh, land civilization these production units using aggregators so the concept of this was commerce is aggregation so to represent a trader you showed a squirrel and if you wanted to show a sword which was one of the most commonly and uh, very sought after item that we traded we we'll look at some of them now the the sword Uh, was denoted by these slashes because what did these slashes uh, represent they represented cuts and you know the the word is khand khand is khand cover khand sundara kandam kumari kandam look at that the idea of these are sections sections and khand portions khand tundam even in tamil tamil you have got the word kandam tundama vetuven look at that so the idea of all these so portions bharata kandam look at the, everywhere you have this idea and what do you call a thing that comes out of cut sugar cane you get the word candy the english word candy comes from it the idea so khand so portion sections a cut aspect so that's how you communicated across lands look at the way the ingenuity they used ingeniousness absolutely in the field of communication is amazing so it is organic natural nature based 
and that's what helped us transcend time, geographies, and civilizations. But if you notice, I mean, we do have our emojis today, but like their name, emoji, emoticon, they are fundamentally still at the level of many of them with emotions, and we need to transcend for various abstract aspects. And here is where our heritage, we are really at a great advantage because of our heritage. For we have dealt with all these various aspects of just pure sound. Our OM, our concept of OM uh, is, is the ultimate in the understanding of the science of sound. Ultimate keyword. And uh, then for mudra, which are hand signs, we have had the karana. For abhinaya, the face signs, we have had the rasa, navarasa. For music, we have organized it into melodies and ragam. And words, we have vak, which has Vakyam, been the language. Vak across everywhere. That's the idea. And this has been the language of the Veda as well. From and finally, then. when we wanted to put it down for preservation, we went into the symbols. Not only symbols, also symbolism. We'll see one very, very beautiful example, which is very relevant for today's uh, lecture. And then the script, akshara and notation. Now, from all this, what we find is that we have addressed the various layers in communication. We have had a good handle because we approached it all the way from Om, which is Pranava, which is the subtle. So from the subtle, we moved to our written scripts and alphabets, which is the gross. And mind and matter. So, so we will transcend both. And which civilization can talk about mind? than our civilization Bharat, which has been consistently documenting it for the last 5,000 years. Only because today people talk about mindfulness and all that, but we have been elaborating it for 5,000 years. And we've had different mediums. So based on the need, we have chosen the mediums. So certain things we have written on uh, cloth, certain on manuscripts, certain on stone. So different aspects. I mean, we have just dabbled beautifully with uh, writing as well as that. So now it will come to where is this Phoenicia? So like I like told you point. earlier, it is the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, here uh, if you can't read from there, you have places like Tyre, Sidon, Byblos, Arvad, Ugrit and very close is Damascus. I am reading some of the names out which are very very relevant to our Byblos, please hold that name in mind, Byblos. From which comes a whole concept, look at that word. So, From that place, the Phoenician land, the town Biblos, you get the e word Bible. Be because it is the book. So the book, if you look at the Phoenician... The book itself comes from Biblos, the word book itself. The, wor the world traces alphabets to actually Biblos in Phoenicia. So when they say Phoenicia, it also goes down to Biblos. The book, the printing, printing actually, the, the compilation of something called a book is traced to Biblos. And look at all the words that have therefore emanated, which we today use in connection with book. Biblos, Bible, Bibliotheque, For Bibliography. And similarly, Damascus that we just saw. Now, India used to send in all this entire path, uh, one of the items that was traded was swords, Indian swords. They, and with watery designs, these swords had watery designs. And uh, watery, wavy design is called Damas. The place that traded is called Damascus. And today we'll also find that there is jewelry called the Damas in the um, Dubai, markets. Dubai markets. It comes from this word Damas because the, because the sword, Indian sword, the wood steel, ur, woods is again a very European word because they couldn't say the word Uruk or Uk. Their tongue didn't roll over to say Uruk. So they call it Oots, that comes from this thing, Damas. So Damas is wavy steel, that's what our steel was design was. Now, in Europe... So oh, we go, have go, seen... Go back, go back, go back, go back, go back, explain this slide. Yeah, so uh, in Europe, they wanted to understand uh, how the Eastern economies, how, how were the Eastern, Asian and Oriental countries, we, uh, how did they fare vis-a-vis -vis economies of the West? And uh, they... Did this millennial report of uh, Angus Madison, which many people have been writing about a lot. We have also been writing about it for the last 25 years plus, since when the report came out, where they speak, see, he personally is a xenophile, Angus Madison, but even then he says, one third of the world trade happened from India GDP for about 
1700 years from the year 1 to 1700 no other country has held sway for 1700 years of giving one third of the world gdp very sadly today however if you try to go and look for uh, these reports you will find graphs like this where they have collapsed one to thousand and therefore if you a single first glance you will look that india is continuously on the decline but this is what you will see actually but it's not so actually it should be, so. it should be like this from one to thousand we have been steadily at 33 percent and then only due to various invasions we started our decline started much later but the point is what we should know is if you, you were 33 percent at 1 ce how could you have suddenly one day woken up and become 33 percent of world gdp you because should have been trading consistently before that no, millennia time. before that because you can't wake up one day morning and, and suddenly say i'm having one third of, of world gdp it must have been sort of built over millennia again for it sustained for millennia more so if you look at that for for many thousand years that is what led was the result of our traveling from tahiti to phoenicia and trading all over and, and leaving footprints everywhere all the footmarks everywhere now for this aspect of trade and commerce while we have communicate is one of the thing accounting is another aspect if you go back transportation overseas over lands that was a key aspect for trade so we had mastered that and we had products to go with it so immediately if you ask we'll say what are the products that go with it everybody will say ah oh, india gave spices no spices was the smallest of the products that we gave actually it was the big five when you talk about big five you normally mean the big five game in eastern africa but no in india the big five is very different it is these products so we had metal in the form of steel zinc copper and various alloys then cotton and silk navigation dyes ma indigo and madder red besides various other but these were the prominent ones then sugar spice and diamonds as well and all of these i mean because we had large ships and such large ships you don't need for spices in fact one interesting thing is we also exported ships we built ships not only did we use ships to export other products but we built and exported ships as well and that's a beautiful story we have written about all of this extensively in our book made in india and the story on shipping and navigation is just just too deep amazing how many of you heard of the merchant of venice by william shakespeare what were the merchants of venice trading in to make the profit for the ships to go and come what is the product what is venice built on it's built in ocean but why Where what is the product Shylock make his money what what is the product is it... lending money is one that why would they want money, to lend money why lend money for what what is the product name of the product indian sugar 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 and spices is uh, istanbul constantinople sugar is venice is indian sugar and the city is, was built on sugar and the bitter story behind the sweet product is today's world demography has been changed because of indian sugar today's world demography is because of the influence of indian sugar Sh and the world palate for so we written a book called while well, sugar is sweet the story of sugar is very bitter that's a reality we have written about on that you can check that later so the way we had a silk route all of us talk about silk route silk route we had a metal route see silk route is 2000 years old at best at best but a metal route from india all the way from uh, hanoi mm -hmm. in east to haifa in the west is 5000 years old we never speak about it that was our strength the metal route of bharat and bharat is right in the middle so that was the key thing okay and now comes the interesting part so trade and commerce look at the word we have for it we have okay products we have had our big five transport nav the word nav navigate it uh, comes from our word nav navai and the uh, aspect of trade and commerce we've called it vanijyam now Why? what is vanijyam look at this word vanijyam so now we come back to the role of communication in this trade and in this prosperity so you can have your product you can have your transportation but if you cannot tell about your product then how how are you going to sell it so the 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 aspect and who are the people who actually who traded? traded who are the who went 
And for that, I will actually come before to this slide where the aspects of communication, we have had names for and a divinity. We have had Saraswati, who, who also denotes the reservoir, the medium of communication, Saras, graceful, Sarasche, Saras. Vidya for knowledge, Vid, Vibhak for words, Vid, Wit, Wisdom, Wit, Vidya, Sharada for the Lippi, Veena for resonance and harmony, Vani for eloquence. Ah, look at that, that's a key point for our discussion Vani, this evening. eloquence, Bharti speech, Shruti for sound, oral sound. Oral. No, and no, no, that is no, no. how. Okay. Look at the word. Why is it Vani? And why is a trader. Go back one slide. Akashvani finds. <laughs> no, no. Why is a trader, here as she says, is called Vanigam, Vanijam. What does it mean? Says, In speaking, you have to be sweet. Your communication should be sweet. A way that person will accept you. That is important in communication. The idea of Vanijam, Vanigam, that's where it comes from. Vani. Explain that. So, this Vani... And who did that? We have our Indian merchants who have traded between Tahiti to Phoenicia, taking all these words and the big five items. We have had a name. We saw a squirrel, right? We call them Shreni, which is the trade guilds. It's a Harappan term. Harappa Mahjadara term. Shreni. And the Shreni comes from the root, which is Shrayam. Shra. And Shra is Shray, is to be noble, to be reliable, to be dependable. That's why you get Ashram, Shrayam and everything. So, where it's Ashraya. dependable, reliable. So, our traders, unlike the Western concept where they caution you and tell you, buyer beware, because the trader will cheat you, we have called our traders Shreya, Shreshta. Because they have been noble, they spoke the truth, they were dependable, their words were dependable, the quality of goods was dependable and their trade was highly noble because it was sustaining the civilization here. If you really go back and interview this with the social organization, you will find these are the people who supported the civilization back home. They would go trade, bring the wealth and use it for upkeep of the civilization. There are so many layers to this entire chain. We can do chain. that later. But it's all written in a book. But the point, look at this. In Europe, it was buyer beware. In India, it is a trader shreshta. Means shreshtan. What do you call that? Means he's a noble person. He will not cheat you. He's dependable. So, Indian civilization gave nobility to the tradesman, the community, the producer, everything. And they said, that's why we have the idea of shubhalab. We don't have profiteering idea because profits is good. Use it for self, growing your business and growing your community. So, it's Shublab idea. And Look at the concepts. It's diametrically opposite ideas, concepts that we have as far as trade is concerned here. And that term, Shreshta. all over the world, all over India, see the same term, Shreshta. In Tamil Nadu, it comes out to become? Shreshti, Siti, Seti, Shreshti, Seti, Chetti, Shetti, Chettiyar. Chetu, Seti, Siletar, Situ. All over the land, including Sri Lanka, all the way up to Assam. Look at the beauty of across the land, right from Harappan times, you have a continuity. And when I told this to some Nagaratar Chetiars about this being noble, do you know what they said? You have given me a reason. All of us have to be noble and good in our trade now. Because we have to live up to the name that the civilization has given us. So that's what we look up to. And this idea of communication is highly exemplified. So, what you see is, you find that we have had various ways of communication, we have excelled in communication, we have brought in a science to the art of writing, sounds, everything, but also uh, resorted to symbols and signs to convey a larger concept itself, rather than speaking too many words. And one of the best example is Sri Sukha Brahmarishi, and uh, Sri R.K. Swami was a devotee of this uh, Sukha Brahma Rishi. And uh, how do you find him? You find him depicted like a, a, a human with a parrot face. Why? Why a parrot face? Why is Sukha Brahma is, is he biologically a parrot? No. He but was why? the son of uh, Veda Vyasa. Sri Veda Vyasa, Veda Vyasa. Krishna Dvaipayana. Sri Veda Vyasa who compiled, recompiled rather the Veda. And Sukha Brahma Rishi, this was transmitted to Sukha Brahma Rishi so that he could then take it to, to the world. rest of the world. So, now 
this brings us back so while we had lot of writing and other techniques the veda were actually always only orally transmitted and you needed somebody with the ability of a parrot to uh, listen it. to take in all that and then just repeat and bring it out again as is without distortion and sukha brahmarishi here stands not just for the idea of transmission but a transmission where no it distortion. was there was no distortion so actually veda vyasa he had uh, come up with a technique of transmission which is of called ashta vikriti where in the veda what you hear today is the same as the veda that he had recompiled and all of this <laughs> is exemplified by this single image of a sukha brahmarishi with a parrot face so uh, this ties us back and ties in so many aspects of we are talking in mma where we are talking about management we are talking about commerce we are talking about trade but the foundation for all this besides the goods and the transportation and the other gross things that are needed are also the subtler aspects of communication and the thought uh, that has to go along with it and uh, this forms just one of the aspect of the many in our heritage and our pride just and, one aspect uh, like we always uh, say you know first you have to know what your heritage and heritage is then you have to own, own you have it. to stake claim to it you can't still have the world saying that phonetics and phonemes and phonicia today i just uh, today morning i read one article where they have spoken about every country and its contribution india has no place in that uh, so, i wanted to actually bring that quote and show just, the magnitude okay, so, of uh, how we have just been bypassed by the world so we have to own it and then we have to expound it and in the case of advertising you have to flaunt it It's both has to happen okay so that's very so the first is to know that's what we are all doing now then own it then only you can expound about it you can flaunt about it. that's when we'll get our, our rightful place in the community of nations in the field of many other things all, all, along with knowledge you can do 3 million 3 trillion 4 trillion but still they say you have no roots but we are the strongest of the roots but we have to know what it is to own it that's what comes up and all of this lies in our name bharat the various aspects of our name bharat right from etymology from the advantage we get because of the location the fact about speech the fact that we enjoy sunshine and the weather all of these you can dovetail into the name bharat, bharat means a land of knowledge a land where people relish knowledge connoisseurs of knowledge we have 200 countries in the world you have 6 7 continents in the world do anybody call themselves as a land of knowledge people of knowledge only us we have been calling ourselves bharat for the last 5000 years meaning people who relish knowledge consistently no other country has called itself no other state city nagara gram nobody only we so consistently we have been land of knowledge land of knowledge land of knowledge. and if we don't know about it if you don't own it and say it repeatedly nobody will take you as a as a person of knowledge that's what we have to get back to so with that uh, small message uh, okay thank you we end this and are open to any questions anything that you have Okay. So one of the questions in the age of rapid technological advancement how can technology be leveraged to preserve and promote cultural heritage this is Sharmila from Coimbatore Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, good. So, actually, uh, we are at an advantage here again. Uh, there are many ways, and in fact, just yesterday's uh, Hindu also carried a beautiful article on Google Arts and Culture, uh, how technology is uh, being used to showcase all of this. But see, here again, there are there are layers. Technology for showcasing is one thing. Using technology to lay claim. so this heritage is the next aspect and third is using technology to further our own knowledge by looking at relevant applications today for today 
is the third aspect. So technology has a role to play in all the three, to, from showcasing to identifying what's relevant. You know, we normally uh, talk about the five A's. First is to be aware. Second is to appreciate. Third is to uh, absorb. Appreciate. Only if you are appreciating, you will open up your gate to absorb and imbibe it. That is when you can then start working on adaptations. And only when you start adapting, then will you find applications. So we talk about the 5A circle when we talk about this knowledge of the civilization from the past. And all of these steps, technology has a good role to play. Yeah. Here somebody who said, Kartik who said about Kuom is our pride. Yes, certainly. But unfortunately, we have abused it. Kuom is certainly our pride. There's no doubt about it. What can we do to make it beautiful? Yes, certainly we can do. See, the, the point is... See, see the two blows that w the water bodies of this land have received. In 1857, momentous year, when India lost one of its wars of independence, because we had many wars before that too, that's not the first one, we had many before that. What did the British do? They said, okay, you are attacking us. We, let's break your backbone. What is your backbone? Your water bodies. Your six lakh water bodies is your backbone. Six lakh water bodies starting from the Zing in Ladakh, all the way up to Anaikat in Kanyakumari. These are your, your heritage. Six lakh water bodies. What did they show? They started something called the PWD department, Public Works Department, and took over all the water bodies into the department. So what was owned and operate owned by the women of the land and operated upon, maintained for the prosperity purpose, they took over by that. So we lost our water bodies legally. To, uh, to, uh, to a department called the Public Works Department and they are sitting there, don't know what is happening in the villages or anywhere. They don't have a list of the what's happening. So that's the unfortunate thing. 100 years later, what did we do? In the name of secularization, we de-divinized our water bodies. Before all our water bodies were divine. So there are two laws. One in 1857 and the second 100 years later, in 1950s, we again de-divinized all our water bodies. Naturally, it led to uncontrolled pollution of right from Ganga uh, becoming, becoming Miley to all the water bodies all over the land. So we'll have to recognize this. We have had a twin blow, legal blows both and go to proper recourse and for this we have to know first only if we know that these are the two problems. Cleaning a local water body, yes, must be done by the local people. Has to be done. E ensuring that there is no garbage going to water bodies is, is must be done. But there is a larger national idea, national discourse that must be understood. What it is. So remove the twin blows. Overcome them again. So that we can recover them back for the next century for our great-grandchildren. Not just our children or grandchildren, but even for our great-grandchildren. That's a duty that we have. That is inheritance. What is sustainability? Taking something which is good and giving to the next generation even better. That's sustainable. And uh, there are a few questions which are all very similar and uh, which to which we have almost answered in our uh, the first question. How are we going to tell those heritage stories to future generations? What challenges do you see in preserving and promoting our cultural heritage in the modern world? Are there any digital initiatives or tools that you find promising for the documentation and dissemination of heritage information. So like I said, today we are finding a lot of tools uh, both for presenting it online, also for experiencing things digitally like VR, AR and so on. But, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, when we started Bharat Gyan, like we said, uh, you know, we saw people showcasing their civilization and we said we want to showcase our civilization. And we started Bharat Gyan with the tagline, we still have the tagline, experience the knowledge of India. Because we said we want people to experience this knowledge because nobody is reading books. Let's make it an experience. But then what we are also realizing is that, that there is really no Indian narrative. There is no Indic narrative about our own civilization. So we have to create that authentic narrative as well. And which is where we got uh, into the act of documenting all this. Because we said, okay, somebody will come and they can create the experiences. But let us start when the tap is open. Let us collect all this data and at least document it for posterity. So that's what we've been doing. So you cannot do away with just uh, writing documentation as well. You need that and so, so we made films. We, till date, we made about 718 film short films because people watch films only for for at best 
150, 180, 200 seconds. So we made about 700 films like that for people to watch, which are quite popular. Many and, people watch that. So that is there. And if you say uh, she said... Uh, there was this, what is the challenge you are seeing in uh, taking this to people? And I would like to dovetail it with the next question here. How can education play a role in instilling a sense of pride and appreciation for one's cultural heritage? Do you think it should be included at school and college level education, the Sabarish? Now, uh, Sabarish, thank you for asking this question because this has been the challenge that we found. You know, we have conducted courses, we have offered them for free, we have spoken to so many people, but yet, you know, the acceptance is just, okay, quite interest, that's all. So, unless you have a whip, people will not be willing to really study or take to these uh, intake to this information and that's where we find that the new NEP where they have brought in Indian knowledge system at the school level and also for college uh, is a very good initiative and hopefully this will pave the way for this knowledge to get into the system in the coming decade everybody then will be uh, will have to at least go through a few courses and somewhere from awareness it will change to appreciation and then absorption and then pave the way so uh, we are really hopeful with this uh, initiative. Let me put a question to you people. You know, in a continuum, there are five big uh, products coming. We have talked about communication, talked about uh, uh, expose, all of that. But there is a navigation stuff there which you never talked about. There is, you just talk about now, we navigation, given to the world. Maybe you can tell us more about how India has been an amazing country when it comes to navigation. See, the word, uh, thank you for a very nice question, very important question. The, look at the idea of the word navy, navigate, comes from the Indian word navai, navgat, navai in Tamil, navgat, nav for boat. So this is a... So, such an ancient idea that we have, we, we not, as you said, phonetics, phonemes, we have been given, not only given ships, we have also given the, the very name for it. Now, all of us know about the, uh, like Indian National Anthem, what is the National Anthem of USA? The Stars and Stripes, right? Star Spangled Banner. Where was it written? In the Boston Harbor. On what? It was written on an Indian made ship. So Indian made ships had traveled to Europe and from there across the Atlantic to the east coast of Americas and similar to the west coast. And that was the level. So we were not only transporting our goods, we were making, selling ships. And look at the oak wood ships had life of 40 years, 30 years, 40 years. Because oak wood, that's all it has in marine aquatic life. Whereas the teak wood ships of India, made in India, had a hundred plus years life. And they were ten times the size of those ships. So, actually, if you see uh, navigation, we have, uh, we have been excelling in navigation from more than 5,000 years. You will see records of the Greek talking about the iron that is coming from India for their battles, the arrowheads in their battles. So we sometimes, we just jokingly, we say, the arms dealer of the yester years was actually India. So all the swords and uh, iron arrowheads, everything was going saltpeter in the, uh, after the British, the colonialists, the colonists, why did they come here? I mean, they found a lot of saltpeter so for, uh, for oh, fireworks and ammunition. So we have actually spurred the arms race in the world in one way. Uh, there are, uh, I would look at navigation in two uh, halves. One is the navigation that we used for our trade and we built our prosperity and we have a saying called Krinvanto Vishwam Aryam where we Meaning? sailed the world over to make it a noble place. Aryam, nobility. Nobility. And we did it with trade. There is a second part where the when the colonials came and they saw this navigation Power, they and the skills, they exploited it for their own needs. So they got us into the ship trade. I mean, where we built ships for them, and they took these ships and colonized world over. We have a beautiful uh, listing of how Britain could not have colonized the world if it, were, if it was not, not for the Indian for ships, the Indian, ships, Indian, ships. Indian sailors, 
Indian shipwrights. So, and the Indian shipping In metallurgy, Indian metals, because you, when you go on ships, you, you need all the all, all the metal works. So, without that, you, Britain could not have colonized. All of Europe could not have colonized. Could not have taken place. A fundamental thing happened. So, that was a game changer for the world. But unfortunately, we lost our uh, navigational uh, prowess. Prowess. It was suppressed during colonial times very uh, wisely uh, you know uh, uh, wisely for the europeans so uh, strategically and now of course we are on the rise and uh, it's only with navigation that we'll come back we've got such a vast coastline that is the strength that we have to play on i hope i've answered part of your question Okay, there is how they escorted Vasco da Gama to can India. Can I just take two yeah. minutes? Yeah. You want me to show the film? We have a film on it. No, because I don't know. Can I take two minutes? Yeah. So, so she'll show you a film. Just a two. It's just a one twenty second film. See when Vasco da Gama came. So okay, we have South Africa. What's the southern tip of South Africa called? Cape of Good Hope. What is Good Hope about it? What? Why is it? Why is that Cape called Good Hope? Hurry, just one second. She doesn't want me to break the secret. She'll show it to you there. Okay. Think, think of those things. Because while we had a naval area, which she actually has a slide for, uh, that shows from all over the Bay of Bengal to the Arabian Sea to the Indian Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, which we call Santi Shagar, we had to go to Tahiti. Whereas the whole of the, uh, what do you call the, uh, look at this, the ship sizes. The largest two ships the world had was Santa Maria and Santa Gabriel, Sao Gabriel. So those were, whereas Indian ships were 10 times its size. See, we normally, we, we realized this when we were at Istanbul. And, uh, you know, at this particular point, many, in about 1300s, when the Turks took over Constantinople and it became Istanbul, that's when our Talavidi was written. Because until then, all the products that we saw were going See, look at this. from here. The fate here. of India changed in the Bosphorus Strait of Turkey in Istanbul. All the products used to go through this route, and the, this was a Byzantine Empire then, and uh, which was favorable to the West. So it would pass from here and reach Europe. But the moment the Turks took over this particular uh, point and made it Istanbul, they cut off the trade route to the West from the east. So all these countries were starving for these goods. They now wanted to find a route and they started traveling. Till then they never came to India. It was the Arabs who would take it along. So they started traveling to India. We had people in 1482, Diogo Chao, he could not find. Then you had Bartolomo Diaz and he tried to come down the coast of Africa and to go to uh, India. And when his ship reached the southern tip of Africa, it his sank. ship sank. In fact, Bartolomo maps, he was the one who charted these seas. That's why maps are called Bartolomo maps. And his ship sank here. So any ship that could go beyond this cross, point cross over. towards India had hope. Yes, good hope. So that is why this point came to be called Good Hope. So India decided the Good Hope for a cape, for a place in South Africa. So then we had Kovilab, we'll skip him. Then in 1490s is when, uh, when they discovered that the world is round, that Christopher Columbus said he will sail westwards to find India. He so said circumnavigate the globe and reach India. He takes the biggest ship, he gets a biggest ship built and he goes around. Till then world ended at Canary Islands for them. They didn't know of anything else. So as he sailed, the first landmass he encounters, he thinks that is India. And that is how he was born the West Indies. Mind you, he didn't go to America yet. He landed only near West he Indies. He never went to the mainland. He only and went to West Indies. West Indies. And the people there, he thought were Indians and they came to be called Red Indians. So, India-centric. His follower, Amerigo Vespucci, who actually ventured further into the main uh, American land. So, that is how he tried. Then came Vasco da Gama in 97. He takes the largest ship from Portugal of his times and he comes down the same path that Bartolomo had mapped, he comes up to Cape of Good Hope and in his own writings, in his diary in Lisbon, he writes that when he comes here, he finds, he is also perplexed how to go because the, ma, ma, Bartolomo did not leave any notes. He finds Indian ships that are 10 times 
the size of his ship and amidst these indian ships he is navigated he is escorted he is even escorted by the indian shipwrights to come when they come by mozambique and they come to the port of korikode calicut and there whom do they encounter they encounter samutti rai samudra rai king king of the seas and what what does he become it it now today we know him as zamorin because of the portugal uh, so portugal and the tongue couldn't say samutra rai it's actually samutra rai because the king of the seas we call it zamorin even today they call zamorin unfortunately see so look at how all we have influenced the world india you find it in east indies you find it in west indies you find it in red indians you find it in indonesia and even cape of good hope while it may not carry the name india it carries the sentiment of india so cape of good hope has also been influenced by india so it is india that has ruled the world so when you see that 33% gdp it is uh, i mean uh, perhaps it's an understatement also and they were all searching for the most prosperous country it was like a uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and this is substantiated by ship sizes of uh, from indian texts which show Nav the Shastra. names of uh, various indian ships and how they were actually uh, this Look is santa maria of uh, christopher columbus sao gabriel of vasco da gama and look at gamini tari jangala plavini the one that could plow through the waters dharini look at it it's also it bears the bears weight, weight. something that can be Heavy transporting stuff. begini one of a fast ships fast the ships begini that we had given them and uh, so there are lot of uh, Mm. Uh, proofs otherwise uh, which talks like about the uh, navigational prowess uh, we have written about all this in great detail uh, especially while these are very ancient even as recent as 1700s 1800s what was the state of indian navigation the harbors the kind of ports and you know who built these uh, ships in fact even Al alexander Nearchus who had come with Alexander in 326 BC when they return uh, mind you we always say Alexander met his defeat at the hands of Porus and then they no, were returning and when they were returning they needed ships to return all his uh, uh, armies were already tired and these ships were built by Indian ship rights thank you sure. i think that's enough uh, he said thank you thank you so much i think we well passed our allotted time Uh, all this content is available in our website bharatgyan.com and our 100 plus books 700 films 700 articles please read them they are all available for all of you thank you so much once again to mr srinivas ikke swami thank you and, sir we have gone so much of knowledge uh, uh, because a lot of people are watching out live so we want to keep the time management may request uh, mali uh, and shankar to step forward and do the honor what we are presenting you is uh, the thing which is painted by our children we do a lot of csr work at the school supported by access system and as trust and so proud of which uh, i may also request uh, yes bala join us please step meet the call Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's the book. Take away. Thank you. 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 Good evening, everyone. Never erase your past. It shapes who we are today, and will help you to be the person you will be tomorrow. I extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. Hari and 
Dr. Hema Hari, gracing us with a lovely presentation and making us realize the richness of our heritage and how it has really shaped our language, our lifestyle, and why we practice certain things as a direct influence of our past. Thank you once again. <coughs> like to thank mr srinivasan swami for bringing them here and enlightening us with a piece of history thank you sir for making every december 11 memorable with interesting speakers and provide us some deep learning a special thanks to mr mahalingam president mma for his warm welcome address like to thank the ec members of mma and advertising club madras for striving to make this better better year after year thank you for group captain mr vijay kumar and the staff at team mma to provide an excellent hospitality like always i also take the opportunity to thank the hindu or print media partner and medianews4u.com our online media partner and other press and media for supporting this event year after year lastly a huge round of thank for all of you uh, to make this time to take time and make it today evening thank you all for making this event memorable thank you thank you mr bala that brings us to the end of the another memorial lecture this uh, we have got over 580 viewers watching it online and that's why number of questions have come we passed down only few questions to you thanks so much uh, thank you uh, for all joining us until we meet again